Daryl Fry of Elko, Nevada has to be one of the greatest dry ground line hunters in the modern era. He is very, very good. He's in his 50s. He's been doing it since he was a little shaver, as he put it. Uh, he hunts Kimmer curs, and they look like yellow labs. They're the same color. They're all the same color, about the same size, but they're very good lion dogs. And he really likes them, and they work for him, and they're very successful. He talks about treeing uh, lions in caves. A couple of times he mentions that. One case, I, I recall that he said he could barely hear the dogs in there, and he goes in and gets them and kills the lion. Man, I'm telling you, I don't know if I'd be going to do that or not, but he, he doesn't think too much of it. It's a rarity that he gets to push a lion up a tree because they tree in the bluffs and the cliffs as well. So welcome, Daryl Fry, Elko, Nevada. Anyway, we're with Daryl Fry of Nevada. Today is July 20th, 2002. Uh, Daryl, if you if you'd tell us a little bit about yourself, where you was born, or how long you've been hunting dogs, that sort of stuff. Yeah, well, I was uh, born in California in 1950. But, uh, I moved to Oregon and was raised pretty much there. My dad had hounds, and uh, so I've been hunting ever since I can remember. About how many years you've been hunting hounds? Forty years, I Forty think. Forty years. And right now you hunt just strictly the uh, Kimmer curse. Yeah. Did you start out with any particular breed or was it just a Duke's mixture? Well, you know, my dad had some black and tans and red bones and uh, uh, that that he kind of had, and, and I hunted them. And uh, then I did uh, about in the early 70s, uh, in my early 20s, I, I got a few dogs from Steve Mathis uh, that were really good lion dogs. And... Uh, I really hunted them up until I went to the to the curves, uh, pretty much his breed of dogs, and with, with a, another dog or two, you know, mixed in and whatnot. But it, I pretty much had Mathis dogs for, uh, from uh, 1970 until. No, I understand that your strain of Kimmers are, are are really cold nosed and very tenacious, no bottom end to them. Yeah, yeah, they're you know the. The strain that I have uh, for Kimmer, he bore and bear hunted in Tennessee, and, and uh, he had a more of a big game type of dog, and, and uh, I just kind of bred him to, to be maybe a little more, more so, especially uh, cold trailing on bear ground, dry ground. And they're not they're not very big either, are they? No, uh, they're you know in the forty pound class. Yeah. And they are really aggressive, a little too much for lions, even. You know. uh, <laughs> it'd be better if they weren't so aggressive. Uh, you wear some of them on your coyotes, too, don't you? Yeah, yeah, they decoy coyotes, frankly. On your strike dog uh, and other strike dogs in the past, would you consider those to be of exceptional intelligence, more intelligent, say, than the rest of your dogs, or just mediocre? Well, no, that, that's probably the thing they need the most is brains. Uh -huh. uh, you know, uh, they, they, well, you know, especially working around livestock, you know, you, they, they have, you have to be able to handle them well. They have to be smart. And, they, and, and uh, you know, to, to take a track that's, you know, where a lot of life sometimes <clears throat> livestock will trail back over a track. And, and they not only have to have a good nose, but they have to be able to figure where the lion went to really move it a lot of times to sometimes there's just nothing there to trade. Are those uh, you find the strike dogs are easier to break off trash? Well, you know, really not necessarily. In fact, sometimes they're harder. I, I think you know uh, uh, a couple of the better ones I've had. Uh, I had one called Striker that that really was my early Kimber dogs and uh, boy he he was the best dog I've ever had any breed and, and the best strike dog but he you know he was a little harder once he you know figured out I, I didn't want him to run him but it's kind of the same way they they don't have a lot of quit in them and, and uh, no matter what they're chasing but but two things once they figure out you know that they can't catch deer and that, that you don't want them to then, then they're really easy to break but, uh, at first they they want to 
you know, chase everything down. Yeah. Well, that's just instinct <laughs> too. You know. Yeah. Do you use uh, the uh, tracking collars and the uh, or the shock collar on occasion? You know, I, I do. It's yeah. it's just easier, and and I think actually, uh, especially these dogs are a little more sensitive that way, and uh, uh, you know, it's it's no fun to do it, and and you don't want to get too rough, especially with these dogs, and, yeah. and uh, that way. Uh, separates you from the process a little bit, and, and uh, I think I think they're a good tool. And tracking collars, uh, I, I really haven't used them until recently, and and I don't really take the tracking unit with me, but I put the collars on them. And it's uh, uh, usually dry trailing lions. You know, you're you're with them most of the time, and and in on the hunt, uh, bear hunting or something, where you know you you hear them top this ridge and you either chase them with the horse and here on top the next ridge or chase them in a pickup on logging roads either way you do lose them uh, hunting quite a little bit but here you don't so much lose them on on the lion or when the lion's tree but but you do lose them you know they'll get separated and go in another canyon and, and so what i use it for is to find them when when they're lost not 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 necessarily uh, to find a treat on the lion because mm -hmm. usually when they do that i'm there you know so uh, it's good that way. I, I know some guys that, especially like in the snow, turn the dog loose with a collar on and wait till it trees and then go to it. But one thing I, I just think you you know you're really never going to learn how to be a good lion hunter if you do it that way. Plus, your dogs are eventually they're going to get in trouble too if you're not you know not with them either. But you know I I don't think that I think that's kind of a little. Well, it's unsportsman maybe, plus it, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's really a good way to, to make a lion dog or be a lion hunter, uh, to, to just use it to find your dogs to yeah. you know, treat someone. You like to be with your dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody I've interviewed is the same way. <laughs> they, they want to be with them yeah. to help them yeah. and help them and everything. Yeah, you can help them, and, and like I say, and you learn, you learn where about lions that way, so sure. your dog. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, do you hunt mostly off a of horseback or an ATV or out of the truck or? Well, I, I either horseback or foot. You know, this is a rough country, and uh, with these dogs too, uh, more so maybe a little bit. But but you know, they go in and kind of comb through these ledges, and and uh, so I go a foot a lot, probably more than the average guy in, in this open country. But uh -huh. uh, I use a horse too. No, using mules. Well. No, uh, not, not too much, you know, uh, uh, I think you have to be a little bit better horseman than, uh, than uh, to be a mule man. And, uh, <laughs> my brother is a mule man in the family. So, oh, he is. Yeah. A... <laughs> you mentioned that you uh, normally hunt six dogs on average. Yeah. Do you turn all those dogs loose at the same time and let them hunt? Yeah, you about have to the way I hunt it, uh, you know, uh, you can't, well, you can't really hold many of them back. So, yeah, I, I free cast them all. Uh, care of your stock, uh, would, would you say that you've got to feed and take good care of your horses, your mules, your dogs? Yeah, and you do, and especially, uh, well, horses, you know, you have to grain them and give them good good feed to, to hold up and, and uh, I don't have a lot of horses anyway so I can't rest on them for very long and with dogs uh, good quality dog food it you know uh, it pays it pays for itself I mean uh, you know I clean my kennels every night and uh, if if the cheap dog food you know you just you know you, you pack half of it off or more and, and they do good and I think it if their life expectancy is longer. Uh, uh, I think if their kidneys don't have to uh, uh, filter out a lot of a lot of impurities and, and fillers and dog food, but I, I think the the best dog food is important. Do you feed do you feed the same food year round, or do you, you know, increase it? You know, I do because I hunt hard in the summer, and and they need uh, a lot of high protein dog food in the winter, and, and um, you know. If, if I was, wasn't was hunting much in the summer, I'd switch to at least a lower protein dog food anyway. But, uh, uh, I, I use the same dog food.
any particular brand? Well, you know, I, I actually have been using Diamond High Pro, and uh, it's a good quality dog food, and, and uh, got a you know meat base, and it's good dog food, and I can get it Twin Falls by the ton for a reasonable price. Would you rather run a lion or a bear? Oh, I'd rather run a lion. Yeah. yeah. I think everybody would. Yeah, like I say, you're in on the hunt, and, and it takes a real good dog to consistently treat lion. Without the aid of dogs, do you know approximately how many lions you've seen in the wild? Well. Just to see them. Yeah. I, uh, I saw one in the field one time when I was driving by. Uh, in the middle of the day, uh, down south of Lund, south of Ely. But, uh, you know, a lot of times when there's a kill, I work from kills, uh, and, and you go to them, and a lot of, I go to them on, uh, without dogs, if I can get too close to them and, and see which, what went on, and make sure that it was a lion that killed it, and, or they track it up and, and, you know, try and figure out what kind of lion I'm after and that kind of stuff. And, and I walked up on them several times that way. And, and a couple times, one dogs have been, you know, trailing off. Uh, I, I jumped, walked up and jumped a line myself accidentally, you know, under a ledge, cutting underneath and cutting across the, yeah, a couple of times. I mean, but uh, very few of them I could even got a shot at. But, you know, I've seen some hunting uh, like that, that uh, my dogs hadn't actually got yet. Mm -hmm. But to the one in the field is the only one I really just ran across. Yeah. It's, you don't see many lions yeah. just out walking around. No, right? you don't. Cowboys, it's been all over this country. A lot of them never have. Yeah. About what age do you think is a good age to start pups? Well, you know, uh, these dogs kind of want to start early, you know, and, and they're a little hyper and, and uh, they, they like to do something anyway. And uh, uh, these dogs, you know, seven months to a year, you can kind of tell when they're ready. But, but I take them when they're even smaller, you know, uh, uh, teaching them to, to follow you and, and uh, get used to the horse and, and things like that, you know, but to really start trying to learn that, uh, you know, seven months to a year. And the cold trail in the summertime, uh, they, you know, they, they don't, they really can't do much for the first year even, you know, they have to be two before they'll just stay, stay on a bad track, you know, and try and work. How cold a track do you think they would start? You know, uh, 12 hours, uh, it, you know, if you get there early, uh, if it killed like early in the evening, any time through the night, you know, if you're there, if you don't hit the track till two o'clock, uh, you know, probably only six hour old track by that time. I know Cal and I, Cal Allen and I talked about this, about the, oh, it's like Lee Brothers said that they had started them five days. And uh, I think Dub Evans had remarked that he had started them at seven days. And I was telling Cal that I got to thinking about that. And that's all they said is that they started them and, and run them. But I think to do that, I think the, the conditions, the weather conditions and everything just had to be absolutely perfect along with the terrain that they were hunting in yeah. had to hold that scent. Well, you know, here, you know, there's nothing much but sagebrush. And a lot of it, there's even no cedars and, and uh, I ledge a lot of lions. So, you know, there's no shade and very little ground cover in a lot of it. But, in, in a case like that, did, did, did they catch any of those by the old draft? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they only mentioned it once. Yeah. Well, so. <laughs> one, one time uh, uh, I did catch a four day old track, but, but the lion, you know, they didn't trail it wherever he went for four days, but, but he, he'd been feeding on a kill and making a lot of tracks. And, and uh, I, I found these tracks two days before. Uh, and another guy had seen them, but uh, I was my intention was just to hunt that country. But but they hit the tracks that were, that I knew were four days old, and uh, and they did catch the lion. You know, one time they were going on it backwards, and I turned them around on this old track. But but it was in a rock pile, and it had gone back and forth a lot of times, and just 
played up and, and fed. And, you know, technically uh, it was four days old at the time. But, but uh, you know, a lot of times in snow conditions, if it's <clears throat> warm, when they travel through there and it freezes, you know, a track will actually last for months. That way, if it thaws out 30 days later, dogs will run, you know, but they'll only run it to where the sun hits it or, you know, wherever it rotted out. But they actually can, a lot of times, trail is kind of like a rotten package, I mean, a package of fish, you know, when it's frozen, it doesn't smell. And, and you know, you can keep it in the refrigerator for six months, and when it thaws out, it smells just like when you put it in. You know, uh, anymore, I, I'm more and more convinced that somebody could absolutely write a book on nothing but scent. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Who are some of the um, better known lion hunters around that you know of? Well, Whitey. Whitey Carroll. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody else? Steve Mathis. He's dead now, but. He was a good line. You know, uh, there, there's, you know, I don't, for, for quite a few years, I haven't hunted much with, with guys like I used to. Uh, uh, and, and a lot of those guys like that are dead. But, but there's a lot of, still a lot of good line hunters. Warner Glenn, you know, we talked about him. And Larry Hendricks and uh, Bill Cameron. You know, there's still a lot of good line. Did you ever get time with Lee Brothers? No. Never did. No, uh, Dale was here a couple of years for I came. And he used to come up and speak Richard Oak. Dale's last dog, they bred the one of Richard's and stuff, but no, I never met him. Yeah. Have you ever been seriously hurt out? No, I fell and broke my hand in the ledge one time. You know, yeah. So. Ever get bucked off out there? Yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you can get bucked off too, and some guys get hurt bad. Then. You know, falls, falls, and being bucked off are probably the biggest real threats. You know, uh, here you put a lot of lions in caves, and uh, uh, well, in fact, caves aren't so bad. Uh, you know, uh, at least the worst thing bothers me about caves and mines or cave ins more than the lion itself. And, and these old mine shafts are really bad. They, they actually scare me. In caves, you know, I've been in them, you know, and the lions generally, you know, back there and, you know, he might be growling and whipping his tail a little bit. But, but, you know, a lot of times when you shoot, you know, the whole top might yeah. come in. You know, yeah. And that's probably what worries me. The only only thing that scares me a little bit uh, is, is uh, you know, mine shafts and caves. Do you ever use or have used any of the uh, sense training sense to start pups? You know, and I, and stuff? Yeah, you know, I really haven't. Uh, here we don't have a lot of small game to start dogs on. You know, we just have lions and bobcats. And bobcats are good in the winter or when there's snow on. But I, I just really haven't done that. You just let the, let the old dogs teach them a little bit. Yeah, I just take them up. <laughs> What advice would you give, say, if there's a brand new lion hunter in the making, he wants to be, he wants to be a big uh, lion hunter or something like that, what advice would you give him if he was just starting out? In other words, he had to go out here and get dogs and get horses or mules and trailer and a truck. What advice would you give him? <laughs> oh, man, don't do it. <laughs> no, you know, uh, there, there's still lots of lions here, you know, that, to make a living at it anymore is tough, you know. Uh, uh, guiding, you know, is it's you know it's expensive anymore. It always was, I guess, but you know it just seems like it is with the price of vehicles and, and dogs and, and horses and, and all the equipment you need. Uh, it, it seems to it does seem to be percentage wise even more expensive and. and uh, no, I don't know. It's it's so, so competitive anymore. It, it's really tough. You know, you know, if I was doing it, you know, I I, I might go to Mexico, uh, where there's lots of lions and, and really no competition. Uh, that's a 
best advice I could probably give a guy because anymore there's just so you know so many guides and and in this state you know other states are shut down to hunt and there's more pressure where you can't hunt lions uh, and I, I just don't it's just tough to get started anywhere and, and and when you do you know the other guides don't welcome you much like they used to you know it, it's awful hard I, I don't know what to you know to make a living with dogs anymore it's, it's kind of tough all right I would think that if a guy could, would be to go to a lion hunter and see if he couldn't hunt with him a little bit. And, and in a way, that's you know, that's the best way to learn. And, and in some ways, uh, that's what I did. I mentioned Ray Rawls, you know, and, you know, when I was talking about good lion hunters, I, I didn't mention him, but he's still a good lion hunter, a good bear hunter. And that, that was the best circumstance I was ever in. And I, I got paid a salary for being a sub guide, and he had all the business worries, all the vehicles, and, and uh, everything. He, you know, he had all the expense, and I, I got to hunt for the salary. And, and staying at camp, I, I put all the money in my pocket. Actually, that was the best job I ever had. And, uh, you had all the fun. I had all the fun, yeah. <laughs> and he had all the headaches. And anymore, it takes years to kind of build up a clientele, and you have to have an income to, you know, some kind of ranch. Uh, you know, if you have a ranch, uh, that, that, you know, an income coming in while you're doing it. You know, uh, that's... That's the only other thing to just start in it and start making a living at it. It's really tough. But like I say, the deal I had uh, is, is uh, the best situation a guy could have. You know, that's that's why uh, all of the guide and outfitters, the lion hunters, whoever, they have taken advantage of every hunt that there is, elk and deer and, and whatever is available. Yeah. They have to go year round to make Right, and we didn't used to have to do that. We could just hunt lions year round. Sometimes bear, but still all dog work. Yeah, I still think that the the key to success is that you have to take care of that that stock and those dogs. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't do that, you're lost. Yeah, you've got to take care of them. Yeah, I know some guys don't take very good care of. Them. I haven't interviewed anybody yet that doesn't take really good yeah. care of their, their stock because they know. Yeah. Well, that's why they're successful. Yeah, it is. Looking back, would you have changed anything? You know, I, I guess I really wouldn't. I've had a pretty good life. You know, I, you know, I've been able to hunt for a living for most of my life. You know, it's about all I've ever done. I, um, first job I had was on a ranch, but, uh, and I logged in Oregon pretty much been able to hunt my whole life and had a pretty good life. You know, I guess I would. I might have spent a little more time with my family when they were younger and I was a little, you know, trying to, uh, well, trying a little too hard. Yeah. That's all. Is there anything you want to talk about or anything you want to say or say hello to anybody? No. I guess not. Uh, you know, uh, you were you were talking. You mentioned earlier uh, earlier when we talked on the phone about lions back trailing and yeah. stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think somewhat on sin. I, I I probably should have never even got into the subject because uh, it's kind of like talking politics to to talk about sin and the dog's ability to sin and those kinds of things. You know, with lions, uh, I have seen them. Uh, even like go by here, we don't have many trees, and like I say, I led a lot of lions. And they, half this country has cedars, and the other half doesn't. But uh, I've seen them go by a tree ahead of the dogs before the dogs actually jumped them, you know, and, and start and then turn around and come back. And they do backtrack over their track because they, you know, they, they always like to go the same way they went. I mean, if you find it track on the trail and you keep watching the trail uh, pretty quick you'll see it again and they take the easiest route and they go out and come back but i'm not so sure you know i just don't know whether they're trying to confuse the dogs when they do that because i think uh in, in that case you know they they changed their mind decided they better get get to, to that was the most, best place to go to 
to get to be secure, you know, because they'll even pull some willows in the creek up underneath them, you know, or like the picture of the one on the big sagebrush. And they'll get on anything. Uh, I, I've treated them on railroad trestles. And they'll get up anything they can to get away. And I, I think in some cases like that, uh, uh, anyway, I don't know where the lion is trying to throw them off. You know, the smart lions that, like, especially in the summer, small females uh, uh, that don't leave a lot of scent anyway and, and have been treated by sport hunters and let go uh, and their dog soured, uh, they're, they're really the worst. Uh, I've got a few lions that have been on studies that are collared and, and some of them are pretty dog soured, but, but the, the bigger males still leave enough scent a lot of times. But how they get away here is in the legends, you know, they can run for miles and, and they're huge and they can, if nothing else, they can get enough distance on the dog to get away. But, but anyway, with backtracking, I really don't think that confuses the dog very much or very often. You know, if they do go to the end of the trail, and they'll, they'll figure it. I think they'll find it because a lot of times I've seen, a lot of times, like I say, being with dogs, uh, I, I've seen the lion go up, uh, you know, ahead of the dogs and trailing on the canyon down the other side and go up the tree for the dogs even actually jumping, you know, or get to where he jumped. And, and uh, you know, this deal where they went by and come back and stuff. Uh, they never even made, you know, they stopped right at the tree. I, I've seen them start treeing, you know, uh, 100 yards away, uh, you know, go, going to the tree. And, and so I, I just don't think uh, many things that they can do as far as confusion in the track uh, uh, really, really confuses a dog very much. You know, uh, uh, time, time is one of the worst things in weather conditions. And with snow, if it's melting and, and you can see the ground kind of steaming in the spring, and, and that's a, that's the a very worst condition, I think. You know, way worse than, than right now here, you know, on dry dirt. I, uh, uh, snow is either real good or real bad. It's not a very dependable scent holder anyway. What about after a good rain? Well, it's the same way. Uh, if, if it stays cool and stuff, you're probably all right, but when a thunderstorm comes through this country in the afternoon, rains hard for five minutes, and then, then you know, if you get the same effect of evaporation, it'll wipe the track out. You know? I just think, you know, a lot of people, being a, a hunter and a trapper, uh, a lot of people think your, your scent goes from here to here by touching it, you know, and that, that uh, uh, you... You know that anyway. That's the way scent gets to here, because what it is, I think molecules of scent float off you more like smoke if you can see it, and you leave a river of scent behind you. And when it's fresh, a dog trailing, going like this, I I believe they're in that river. And when they zig here and they go out of it, they turn and go back, and and they're not really smelling where the lion touched the ground. And and a lot of times you'll see them off of the track uh, a ways, but. But the scent is, like I say, is a trail behind them. In the same way with back trailing or being, you know, jumping high up in a tree, you know, they, they, you know, that scent, like gravity. In fact, if there's no wind it, in your calling, it'll run downhill and pull in the bottom, uh, and, and a coyote can come up and hit it without even the wind actually carrying it to him. And anyway, uh, I, I just think that Montague Stevens, uh, you know, uh, was had bloodhounds and, and he had a standing bet that uh, nobody could lose one of his dogs in two hours and he never paid you know a hundred dollars and this was in the late 1800s and guys tied coal rags on their feet and uh, one guy carried the other guy piggyback and he never paid a penny because you know their sense coming off of them and uh, you know a dog can trail you down the road in a pickup and so really I just don't think there's any tricks that a, that an animal can do, uh, at least things that they try to do to throw a dog off. You know, like I say, they get away here in the, in the ledges, and they can get away with uh, rapid evaporation of, of moisture. You know, yeah. Like you say, a warm a rain in summer and spring, you know, springtime and that kind of stuff. And, you know, a lot of times the dog can go backwards. You know, and, and uh, you won't catch them, and they'll lose them that way too. But uh, once they're on a decent track, unless they can 
get in the ledges and get a, a big lead on them and stuff. They pretty hard to lose it off them. Well, Warner, well, I mean Warner Glenn, Cal Allen, Jim Stahl, all of them say the ledges are the worst. Yeah. And uh, Warner Warner keeps talking about how he has to help the dogs. He said, you get in those ledges, that line might jump up on a ledge there and the dogs be back and forth. He, he said, you got to lift them up there and, and, and push them on. And, and Cal Allen says the same thing, you know, that you've got to help them. Warner and uh, Cal Allen both agreed with this. Uh, Warner says to be successful that, that you have to have dogs in your pack that are, some of them are what he calls locator dog. Some of them are a tree dog and some of them are a track dog. He said they kind of all work together as a, as a team. Do you uh, experience that or? Yeah, yeah, you know, and that's one reason for, for having more dogs. Really, two dogs can catch any line going. Yeah. But, uh, you know, they, they can hunt together better and, and you do have that some that are stronger in some, some places and others. And even in ledges, you know, there's. There's dogs that are really, these dogs actually are pretty catty. I don't have to help them much. Yeah. Uh, but some of these ledges here, you know, run for miles. And it's not so much uh, that, uh, you know, the lion's in there, but he can go places they, they can, and you can't even find them. You know? yeah. I just had, had them in ledges with, you know, you can get across the canyon and look over and look from the top down, but they can be in a, in a crack. And, and uh, you know, the dogs are even baying, treeing on them. But you just can never find them. Wow. That's one way they get away here, all right. It's just a, you know, a mile long ledge that's, you know, 500 feet high, 1,000 feet high. Well, maybe not 1,000, but 500 feet high. Yeah. Did you ever run uh, much bear? You know, I did when, in Oregon. In fact, uh, when, when I was a kid, I ran from them bear in many. They're pretty nasty, aren't they? Yeah, they are. <laughs> <laughs> All these lion hunters, they don't want to run bear. All they want to do is run lions. Yeah. Well, and, you know, a good lion dog, really, oh, I would be ashamed to, to lose a good lion dog on a bear because it takes a different kind of dog. It doesn't take the, you know, white, you know, a good bear ground lion dog, a good strike dog like that, and they're worth their weight in gold. Yes. And, uh, you know, they come up along, some of them, the really great ones come along about once in a lifetime, but but uh, good bare ground lion dogs that you can hunt any turn loose and hunt anywhere. Uh, yeah, they're you know too too valuable to risk. But but I in a way I do like hunting bear, especially horseback. You know, and running, jumping logs. It's kind of like an English fox hunt. And, uh, they're they're fun to you know, and a really good aggressive bear dogs. A, a pleasure to own. You know, Bite a bear and beam up, and uh, these curves are they're really they like anything that bites, uh, they're really good at that. Well, a lot of these these youngsters just starting out, they think those bears are pretty easy to run, and in reality, yeah. a bear can flat run. They can, hey, you can you can wear yourself out. Yeah. There, ain't, there isn't a lot of that following them on foot on bear hunting. Yeah, you, know, I mean, you gotta either horseback it or drive and listen. And, they're mean too. Yeah. They are. <laughs> yeah. 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 A lot of them, you know, especially Deputy, I worked on bee yards and timber companies, and uh, a lot of them are kind of sour bears too. And you have to shoot a lot of them on the ground. Anything else? Yeah. Uh, really have you ever been scared while you're out? Well, you know. Actually, like I say, in, in caves, I, I yeah, have well, spooked yeah, dogs. I guess I have to that, yeah. yeah, you know, uh, I, <clears throat> I caught one one time, and it'd been in a fight with another lion. It was chewed up uh, uh, all all over, but it had a front leg that was just ooze and pus, and it was, you know, three or four days old, and, and he was on the rod anyway. And this cave went straight down and then turned left and then went into a little male slot looking thing and then opened up in the big room. And uh, it, it was highly agitated to begin with. When I first walked up there, it kind of came to that entrance and looked up and growled at me and Owen, but, but before I could shoot it or anything, it, it changed its mind and went back in there. But I, uh, there, there was a Mexican fellow that was tending the stock and he went with me and, and I crawled in that hole and I had him go down there. I thought maybe he could pull me out or something that bad. Well, anyway, uh, 
I, I could hear that lion growling in there and, and well I had to go get him to get a flashlight and anyway uh, when, when I looked in there I thought it might be on the side of this hole because uh, I could see kind of in the room and I couldn't see it and, and when I started crawling in the light shined in and out and he could see the lion sitting right over the hole there was a crack in that rock and he could see his foot you know, and he, he told me to come here and look and, and it was it was standing right over the hole Anyway, I, you know, there wasn't anything I could do about it, and I crawled in there and shot it. Anyway, that was a little spooky. But most of the time, you know, once you do a lot of this and get close to lions, you're not too afraid of the uh, the lions. Great yeah. front or hind feet. Well, you know, when I saw them, and the first one I saw, and and uh, I, I've always had the you know, kind of opinion that they use their front feet, and, and I still do, but I have seen them where it'd be pretty hard for them to do that, and, and Steve, uh, you know, he, Steve and Wiley, Wiley's asked everybody, and, and uh, you know, even so, he won't tell you what his own opinion is, but, but I still have this sense that they do it with their front feet, because it just looks to me like they do, but, but Steve has really studied it a lot, and, and he's had lions, you know, and so is Wiley. Both had, but none of them have ever scratched in captivity. Uh, ben Lilly supposedly had one, and he was shooing the horse. You probably heard that. And he used his hind feet. And, you know, like I say, it's obvious. But anyway, Steve's, you know, worked on movies and, and with a lot of other cats and tigers and lions and been places where they've been together and they start scratching the, the, even the pavement with their, their hind feet, calling to one another. And, and, uh, you know, he, he's convinced, you know, they, they squat real low. You know, I, uh, I'm used to a coyote scratch where they kick with their hind feet, they throw mm -hmm. dirt out. But he say, says they squat and push just like this. And, and I can see it, and I try and tell myself that it's probably the right way. But I still I still think they do it with their front feet. <laughs> I know in Wiley's book, my gosh, he, he must have 40, 50 responses yeah. in his book. Yeah. And I would say it's 50 50. Yeah. yeah it is. About half of them say the front and the other half says the back. Yeah. I guess that's going to be, that, that'll be just like politics. You'll never solve it. Yeah. I, you know, and even when people have seen it, you know, they, they don't know whether it's a fluke, you know, because cause I, I don't know. Like I could say, I, you know, my, <laughs> my scientific mind says it probably is on my feet, but I just, uh, you know, it just looks like something that's done. With their front feet. In calling your dogs to you, do you still use the old time cow horn or something else? No, you know, I just holler at them. Just holler and they come back. Yeah. I used to use a horn, but uh, no, I just holler at them. Yeah. Less, less, some, let something less than pack. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess that's about it. I don't have any other questions unless you got something. No, I don't. I just, uh, you know, hunting's been a good way of life. I wish everybody could have the opportunity to do that. I met a lot of good people. A lot of fun. Well, you had a lot of memories, too. Yeah.